I am really grateful and honored to be here. And um, Nancy, really, there's nothing else to say. That was just <laughs> beautiful. Um, uh, and I want to say a couple things about it, though. Um, I had two, two thoughts came to mind. I had a professor in seminary, Dr. David Willis, who would say, uh, believers uh, in Christ have, have two choices on Sunday morning. You either behave like a Christian and don't make it to worship, or you make it to worship and things get a little nutty. And uh, he says, that's why we Presbyterians do confession together every week. Um, but the other thing is, I was thinking to myself, I have two boys. And I would have loved for them to be fighting for the bathroom. They rolled out of bed and got in the car. I was like, you're not going to shower? <laughs> but, uh, so, anyway, what a beautiful, what a beautiful image of those crazy Sunday mornings and a beautiful witness to your uh, discipline of being in worship. In fact, I was thinking uh, Monday night my session gathered and we always worship together first. And um, we... Uh, some people were coming straight from work, had not heard about what had happened in Boston. Um, and I really, we had our confirmation class with us, and they led us in worship. And the closing to the prayer of confession was, strengthen us anew, O God, that we might choose Christ's way. And I could barely speak when it was over thinking about uh, the power of that prayer and how really every time we gather for worship, for education, for fellowship, that is our prayer whether we use those words or not. And who of us doesn't think the world needs more and more people praying that prayer in one way or another? Strengthen us, strengthen us, strengthen us to choose the way of peace and grace and love justice. What we're doing really matters. Let us pray. Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts this morning be acceptable and pleasing in your sight, our rock, our Redeemer. Amen. How many of you went to church this Sunday? So that was kind of a trick question. You didn't go to church. You went to worship. You are the church. Now this is not just semantics. I don't think. You know, we teach our children Right? Everybody do this. Do you remember this? <laughs> Here's the church. Say it with me. Here's the steeple. Open the doors and see all the people. That's really bad theology. <laughs> it should have been, here is a building. It has a steeple. Open the doors. The church is the people. The church is the people. It's not the building. It's not the institution. And we have come through a period in the church's history where the buildings were honored and the institution was honored. And so in some ways, many of us, and I don't just mean clergy, I also mean lay leaders, so that includes all of us, uh, have done what uh, Eugene Peterson says, we've abandoned our callings, problem is we never left the church. Now what he means by that, what I take it to mean, is that we got into the business of institutional maintenance and lost sight of our mission. And we were talking before breakfast about, oh, how people bemoan, you know, the church is, you know, dying and this and that, doesn't have the same status in the culture and membership is dropping. Well, you know, that maybe isn't all bad. Because maybe we're going to get back to doing what we're called to do. It's just really, really easy when the church as an institution has a lot of, you know, public clout for us to get caught up into a consumeristic model of what it means to be church. We go to church where clergy 
provide religious services, and members are consumers and customers. And our primary calling becomes customer satisfaction. Now that doesn't sound right, does it? It's not our primary calling. It's absolutely not our primary calling, and I tell my staff all the time, and mostly I say it to myself, as long as I get caught up in that, I'm not going to be able to be a minister of word and sacrament. Customer satisfaction is not our calling. That is a consumeristic model where, we, where people shop for faith, right? Remember that book several years ago, Shopping for Faith? I tell people in our new member class, you know, I know you're going to use this language, and some of them actually do in their introductions, so it's nice. I say it nicely. You know, you, you're not shopping for a church. You shop for jeans, and you look for a good fit. In a church, you are discerning a call. Now, part of discerning that is, does the, is this a good fit with my theology, with you know, what I think the church should be doing in the world, all those are important questions, but the, they come under the umbrella of is God calling you to join in the worship, fellowship, ministry, and mission, and service of this particular people? That's different than asking, do I like it here? That's customer satisfaction. And that's not our calling. And for us in the church, it's really important that we get clear that customer satisfaction is not our primary calling. Our calling is to proclaim the good news. It is to proclaim the good news and to make disciples. That's our calling. And one of the things uh, that, that Christian um, Smith, who's, who's uh, at University of North Carolina, perhaps you've read his work, he, he did a lot of work with teenagers uh, and, and their relationship with the church. And one of the things he found out after interviewing thousands of teenagers is that when they articulate their faith, what they articulate is what he calls a moralistic, therapeutic deism. In other words, here's what they're getting from, these were mainline churches, so I'm talking to us. Uh, what they're getting is what they're able to articulate is a distant God wants me to be good and feel good. Now, I don't think that's the gospel. The gospel is the God of creation who is remaking this world has a call and a claim on your life and you're intended to serve God's purposes in this world. You get, to, you get to cooperate and collaborate with God and God's people in bringing hope and love and justice and to a broken world. That's the gospel. Follow Jesus. Pray to be strengthened to choose Christ's way. That's what we're proclaiming. Good news and making disciples. That's our calling. I remember uh, distinctly years ago, I was at a youth conference. Uh, actually, it was a youth leaders conference. So all these youth leaders were gathered. And there was a seminar uh, being given on um, how, how uh, marketers were going after teenagers because they're an enormous share of the market. Uh, so they were talking about this um, special that had been on merchants of cool. And uh, how, you know, everybody from Sprite to Adidas to whoever was, what they were really marketing was an identity, right? And, and how powerful that was that what marketers were going after our young people and this and that. And, and uh, you know, one, one very distraught youth leader raised her hand and said, how are we supposed to compete with all this? And another very wise youth leader, Marty Hazelwood, said, we don't compete. In the church, we are not marketing. We are proclaiming. We are not selling. We are announcing. We are announcing the good news that God has a claim on your life. Come, follow. 
So I think my, my great hope and desire is that those of us in the mainline church would become more committed to our mission and less concerned about customer service and customer satisfaction. I think, Nancy, when you said, you know, I hear the good word proclaimed, I hear good news proclaimed, and then I share it with the teenagers in my Sunday school class. Well, my hope and desire is that you'll also share it with your coworkers, with your neighbors, with your, you know, I think one of the things that we in the mainline churches have failed at is helping the whole church find their voice of faith in the public realm. We have abandoned that to those who do it in a different way than us. And so our, our message isn't out there. I had a 22-year-old at my house last night, long, long-term friend who was a previous member of a congregation I served, and she's now in Germany. She's met this boy. She says, he thinks, you know, all Christians are crazy because he's seen those who are speaking in the public realm. I try to tell him I was part of a congregation that was different. He doesn't believe me. He never knew that because our, our folks, our mainline people, need to find their voice, find a vocabulary for proclaiming the good news in the public realm. And that's what day one helps us do. It helps us who are preaching week after week. It helps members. It helps us find our voice and vocabulary for proclaiming the good news and announcing the kingdom of God is near. One of my um, great, great, great privileges in life has, to, uh, has been to be the daughter of a coach. Uh, my father is a basketball coach, and he's retired, but he served for, um, served, uh, and it was service. Uh, he, sir, he, he, he coached for years uh, at, in the Division I, and um, last... Does everybody know Lefty? Does everybody know Lefty? Well, he's, he's a, he's, he was just honored. I just came back Tuesday from, um, uh, at the University of Maryland. They uh, honored his time there, and um, it was really special. But, but here's what, a couple things I learned from my dad. One is that practice matters. So, you know, I used to go with my dad to practice. And I was always observant that they always did the same thing. They dribbled, they shot, they did free throws, they did their defensive stances. They did the same things over and over and over again. That's what we do when we go to worship on Sundays, not to church. When we go to worship, we do it over. We practice the fundamentals of our faith, prayer, listening to the word, opening our lives to the call of God. The other thing I really recognized about my dad the other day, he had a chance to talk, and finally my mother had to say, honey, you've got to stop. <laughs> and she says, I'm not kidding, honey. Uh, <laughs> Because he was up there pointing all across the room. Eloise! She was in the ticket office. She was the best sa ticket salesperson ever. Jeff! Jeff was the trainer. He did this and he did that. Sheila was my assistant. I don't know how she got away with that. She, she, she suffered greatly. <laughs> he mentioned every walk on, every, he, he couldn't stop. And this is what I learned from my dad. Every body matters. It's the priesthood of all believers. Every member, every member has the power to proclaim the good news. And it is our job not to satisfy them as customers, but to empower them as proclaimers of the good news. So as we hear from James and we have come to pray together, after that we will leave to be the church. Amen. Amen.